plug on this side too. Turn his microphone on, Drew. Or no. on. Okay, start. Okay. Well, um, sorry for the delay there. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, a friend and colleague, Professor David Levinson, as uh, today's seminar speaker. Dr. Levinson is a faculty in civil engineering. Uh, he's one of the most um, active members in uh, transportation research in our university. His uh, uh, research activities range from uh, traffic flow modeling to ramp meter control to, um, to research in uh, transportation management policy and uh, economics. He's just finished writing a book called uh, Financing Transportation Networks. Uh, it's going to be published next month. Uh, most of you know about the, the shutdown in ramp meters that occurred last year. The, the Minnesota legislature shut the ramp meters down for two months. Um, to study the effects of that on traffic flow. And Dr. Levinson was um, one of the people that uh, MinDOT hired uh, to study the effects of that shutdown. So today he's going to talk to us about that study and uh, about RAM meters in general. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to present here. Ramp meters have been deployed in the Twin Cities. Um, they were brought about in the 1960s in Chicago as the, f the first implementation. And the basic idea was, the, f the, first, the first order idea was to break up platoons entering freeway. Oh, Excuse me, sir. Can you click your mic on here real quick? There you go. Cool. Thanks. How's that? Okay. So the, the first idea was to break up platoons of vehicles entering the freeway. So by turning the light from green to red relatively quickly, cars would stop. And instead of five cars trying to merge onto the freeway at once, there'd only be one car at a time. Traffic would operate more smoothly and operate better. But in Minnesota, they had another idea, which was to use this to manage flow at bottlenecks downstream of the entrance ramps. And the idea would require metering a number of ramps in a particular zone. So this is the idea that, that is referred to here as zonal control. And in order to maintain smooth flow through the bottlenecks, and this would basically be transferring congestion from the bottlenecks to, to the ramps. Um, the implications of this, of course, were long delays at some ramps, which many of you may, may remember. Um, I'm sure everyone has their favorite on-ramp, which you know, they thought was ridiculous, and they, they had questioned oh, MnDOT sanity when they were doing this. Uh, and they weren't the, you, you as a traveling public aren't necessarily the only people questioning this. As Raj mentioned, in October and to, through December of 2000, there was a shutoff period of eight, for eight weeks where all of the ramp meters were turned off, turned to flashing yellow, basically. And we can then allow us to compare the ramp control strategy that MnDOT had before this period to no metering at all to see its implications on traffic flow. Metering did not really take off. I mean, it was 
you know, being deployed fairly slowly up until 1990. The reason for this was meters are cheaper to, in, to install than, than roads are to widen. And so as a traffic management strategy, the idea is that, well, if we can manage, make, make our roads operate more intelligently, it, we can get more capacity out of the existing infrastructure. And so as it becomes more and more difficult to build new roads, meters became more popular until they were deployed pretty much uniformly throughout the, the Twin City Freeway network inside the Beltway. And as I mentioned, the idea is to keep flow at what we might call as this point right here, the sweet point, where traffic, f traffic speed is still pretty much free flow speed and traffic flow is at its maximum. This relationship, this is the graph between traffic flow in terms of vehicles per hour and traffic density in terms of vehicles per kilometer, is, a, is a considered the fundamental diagram of traffic engineering. Now, it is a fundamental diagram. There is a lot of argumentation about what the exact shape of this particular curve is in terms of the empirical evidence. Our, our best sense is it looks something like this. What goes on here is congested flow, very high density. Um, and because the density is so high, we're not able to get maximum flow through the bottlenecks. What's going along on this side of the graph is basically traffic moving at free flow speeds. Traffic's getting heavier and heavier. The speeds aren't declining until you, you reach saturated, saturated conditions. And depending on how steep this is, how curved this is, where exactly you want to meter the flow, becomes a key question. MnDOT metered it just below this critical point, so sort of as a safety margin. And one of the questions is, well, how, how far below this critical point were they? And this depends on what the capacity of the, of the roadway is in terms of the maximum number of vehicles per hour that can go through a particular bottleneck. Um, traffic has been getting, um, Obviously, there's been more traffic over time, more people trying to use the freeways, but tr drivers have been driving more aggressively over time. People are willing to follow each other more closely. So what may have been capacity in 1970 isn't necessarily the same as what capacity is in 2000. So this requires some empirical evidence. But of course, if you're metering traffic, you don't know what this point is because you never get there because you've imposed the meters. So one of the great things about the metering study is it allows us to look at what the em empirically look at <clears throat> what the capacity is of the freeways. So the Minnesota algorithm, th this, is the, this is, if you were to look at their web, web page pre the shutdown, this is what would have been on there, and this was quickly removed during the shutdown. Um, the idea is to look at input, input flow and output flow and to control the ramp metering rates, the, the metered on ramps, such that the input flow and the output flow and the amount of flow that you thought could be sitting on, the, on the, that section of freeway, where to capacity, yeah? What's the definition of the word volume in the Volume is traffic flow. Um, what are the traffic flow, um, vehicles per hour. Vehicles per hour? Vehicles per hour. Um, I probably have to apologize for my profession. Vlo volume and flow are used interchangeably in traffic engineering. Um, and so it's just sort of second nature to us to, to use them, obviously, in other professions, flow and volume have different meanings. Okay, so vehicles per hour, vehicles per unit time. So we have this kind of basic premise that you have a certain number of factors you can't control, the flow that's coming onto your freeway from upstream, um, the flow that's entering the freeway from unmetered ramps. Okay, those things happen, you have to accept them, but you can control the ramp, the ramp meters, the freeway to freeway meters, for instance, as if you're coming from 694 to 35W, there used to be a ramp meter there that was active. Um, and you can compare that to the number of vehicles exiting prior to your critical bottleneck. What you believe your bottleneck volume is at capacity Okay, and this is treated as a constant, but the question is, well, do you really know what that was in the space available in the zone? And that depends on how many vehicles you think can be within your particular traffic zone. So that was the basic idea behind ramp metering. And this study is gonna, is, was designed to evaluate whether ramp metering was good or bad. And the, question, the first question you might ask is, well, how do you define what good or bad is? 
um, the, the official title of the study was Measuring the Equity and Efficiency of Ramp Meters. There's a lot of ways of measuring equity and efficiency. And you can ask, efficient for whom? And so w there are a lot of potential measures of effectiveness. Broadly, we can break them out into the, the mobility category, accessibility, utility, productivity, reli and, and we can also look at questions of travel reliability and potential demand responses. There's sort of a longer term change in, in what's going on. And we can also look at equity. How fair is the system? How is the system distributing delay across the various users? Is Minnetonka benefiting at the expense of Minneapolis? Okay, questions like that. Um, so is the, the system distributing delay fairly across the system or across time periods or across other things that you can measure? So the, the number of measures that we looked at, um, rather than assuming that the system was operating efficiently if it was simply maximizing flow through the bottleneck, we wanted to consider what are these other things that we, we can help that we can use to help define what an efficient system might be. The blue network here is basically the, freeway, the metered freeway system. The areas in red are the study areas that we looked at. And we looked at these particular sections primarily because of data availability. Um, there are detectors on almost every freeway segment of the system in the Twin Cities, which means that on any freeway segment between an on-ramp and an off-ramp, or an off-ramp and an on-ramp, we know the flow every 30 seconds. We know the occupancy, the number of vehicles that are occupying the detector, the percentage of time that's, that the detector is occupied, and thus can estimate the density on that road segment in terms of the vehicles per kilometer. Those are knowns. What we don't know in most places is how many people are getting on the on the on-ramps. We know how many people are leaving the off-ramps on leaving the on-ramps, that is, after the light turns from red to green, we have a count of how many people have then entered the freeway. We don't know how many people are queued up behind the red light at most of the detectors in the system. But where, the, where it's marked red here, we do have estimates of that. So th the key question is, when MnDOT was looking at the system prior to 2000, they were looking at what was going on in the freeways, ignoring what was happening on the ramps on the premise that if they were maximizing flow on the freeway, they should be doing a good thing for society overall because if there's more people using the freeway, presumably there's less people using the arterials. And while that may make some sense in a theoretical, in a theoretical context, the problem is you don't really know how much delay you're saving on the freeways versus how much delay you're creating on the ramps if you don't know how many people are on the ramps. So, Fortunately, in those places that are marked red, we have upstream detectors at the ramps, which allows us to know how many people have entered the ramp and how many people have left the ramp. Okay. In some places, the detectors weren't there, but special studies were done with the video cameras that you might have seen um, on the MinDOT's website or on their MinDOT's cable channel. Um, they focused those cameras on the ramps and counted the number of vehicles there, um, which fortunately they did and it was not something that I had to do and sit there and make note of how many vehicles are on, on the ramp, but it's a laborious task if you haven't automated it. So what we, we know is what happens across particular detectors. Okay. Has a car passed? How long is the car over the detector? What we don't know is where that car is going. We don't know where he enters the facility and where he exits the facility. We don't know if he gets on at exit, you know, entrance ramp one and leaves at exit ramp five or leaves at exit ramp 10. That's not knowable from this. We would have to do a much more detailed study in, in terms of monitoring every vehicle on the system, essentially. And one could imagine the technologies for doing that. Could be as simple as matching license plates entering the fa facility and exiting. Um, but there's no standard way of doing that that's, that's been deployed, and it's a quite costly endeavor. But we can estimate the time it would take if you were to make a trip from entrance ramp 1 to exit ramp 5 or wherever you wanted to go. So we can construct what we call trips from our, from our origin ramps to our destination ramps or our off ramps. And we can use those, tri that trip measure, that, those trip times to see how the system compares before and after 
um, with or without ramp meters. So basically, we're taking our data. We're calculating our ramp delay where we can, our freeway segment travel times. Use that to calculate speed, trip travel times, and travel delay, which is the difference between what the actual travel time is and what the free flow time would be if there were no delay. And then we use those to estimate various measures of effectiveness. With the detectors on the freeway, it's a relatively straightforward thing using our fundamental relationship that I showed above to estimate speed. We measure density, um, we measure flow, we can estimate speed as a, as a, as a function of those two things. The Q equals KV, as we say, flow equals density times speed. On ramps, if we have our upstream detectors, We know, these are labeled backwards, um, we know how many vehicles have arrived at the ramp with our upstream detector. We know how many, how many vehicles have left. We can do cumulative counts and estimate both the number of vehicles that are there and when the nth vehicle arrived and when they left. And the difference between the time of when they left and when they arrived is the amount of delay that that vehicle suffered. And in essence, the area between these two curves is the total delay on that ramp over the congested period. So using this kind of queuing analysis, we can estimate the delay on the ramps. This hadn't been done um, prior to the shutoff at any point in time. So the shutoff in, in was sort of the, the, the um, spark that allowed us to estimate what ramp delay actually was. You know, when people would say that they waited 20 minutes at the ramp, you, know, you were sort of had to take it on, on faith that they were telling you the truth and not giving you an exaggerated report. But with a queuing analysis, one can measure it systematically wherever you have those particular detectors and see whether, in fact, people were waiting 20 minutes. Okay. And to estimate travel times for origin destination trips, okay, we have to synchronize the ramp delays with the travel time. You exit the ramp at 3, you know, 3.53, you're on the next segment at 3.54, at the next segment at 3.55, and so on and the travel speed on each of those segments at a different point in time varies. So, so there's a lot of synchronization of the data that has to go on. Now, if we're interested in equity, what we might want to do is compare how much of the delay is received by each share of the population. Um, one might think of it as, if one were to think of it in terms of income, and we had income on this axis instead of delay, and there were one person who had all of the money and everybody else had no money, this curve would be L-shaped, okay, so, and it would be very inequitable because the distribution of incomes is very, is very uneven. Similarly, the, we can look at the cumulative distribution of delay and what percentage of the population gets what percentage of the delay. So for instance, if 50 of the, the bottom 50% of the population gets 50% of the delay, things are perfectly fair, delay is uniformly distributed, and we're on this 45 degree line. If it isn't like that, and the bottom 50% of the people, or the best 50% of the people only receive 20% of the delay, and the worst 50% of the people um, receive 80% of the delay, we have some inequity. And we can use this kind of distribution to estimate how equally distributed is the delay. And this isn't to say that what you want is an equal distribution of delay, but you can compare with and without and see whether ramp meters are more or less fair in terms of distributing delay than not having ramp meters. Um, one of the complaints, of course, is that ramp meters benefit some people at the expense of others. We can see if that's true and see to what extent that's true. Okay. I'll skip that. Accessibility is a measure, an efficiency measure, somewhat different than mobility. I mean, you might think, well, what you're trying to do is maximize the speed on the roadway at, while simultaneously maximizing the flow. Okay, that's an efficiency measure. Another way of doing it, uh, thinking about it is, what is the purpose of the transportation system? It's to serve destinations, okay? People don't travel except to reach things. So we might want to know how well the system serves people in reaching their destinations. So we can measure accessibility as a function of how many things you can reach multiplied by some function of the travel time that it takes them to get there. 
For an economist, we might think of what they call consumer surplus, or in particular the change in consumer surplus. What is the change in price? What is the change in number of users with and without? And if there are more users and a lower travel time, people are better off. And if there's fewer users or, or a higher travel time, people are worse off. And so we can look at this um, trapezium here, measure how much, um, in a sense, vehicle hours um, improvement or loss there is with metering. So these are some of the results. This is from Trunk Highway 169. Um, there's two graphs here. The top graph compares equity. Solid line looks with metering. Dashed line looks, looks without metering. And average travel delay by origin destination pair. So if you're going from um, all the way from basically 494 to 694, okay, from the southern, this is, this is 169 northbound, um, this, is a this is a long trip. Whereas if you're going from the exit just before f um, 694 on the north side, to 694, you have a relatively short trip. In terms of average delay, without metering, okay, people had a lot of delay. And with metering, the total delay in the white boxes here, relatively even across the population. But the interesting thing is that without metering, long trips have a lot of delay. And short trips have very little delay. Okay. So we have this trade-off between long trips and short trips. What happens? You compare the, the comp compare the metering off versus the metering on case. If you're making a long trip, if you're going from 494 to 694, your much your your trip is much improved with metering. Okay. If you're making a short trip, your trip is much worsened with metering. Now, if you look at the total delay in the system, clearly there's more delay on the freeways um, without metering than with metering. But if you're looking at who benefits and who loses, the long trips are clearly benefiting at the expense of the short trips. Okay. This can be seen in another way in this graph, which looks at equity. The distribution of delay across the population, when metering is off, the distribution is much more even. When metering is on, it's less even. It's less fair. Ramp meters are achieving mobility for the entire population overall at the expense of fairness, which means that they're improving people who are making a lot of use of the freeways at the expense of people who are making very little use of the freeways. Is this a good thing? Well, that's a policy question. One could argue that interstate, the interstate highway system was designed for intercity trips. Okay? It wasn't designed to serve commuters in the Twin Cities. It was designed to serve people who are traveling from Minneapolis to Milwaukee to Chicago to the East Coast. And that all of this commute stuff should be discouraged from using the intercity highway system to begin with. But that idea was probably given up 25, 30 years ago as people realized that the, inter the interstate highway system was, was a beautiful means of bring, bringing people from the suburbs into the city. Now the question is, do we want to bring people from the outer suburbs into the city at the expense of allowing people within the cities to move around on the freeways? Metering by making a 10 minute trip 20 minutes and a 50 minute trip 60 minutes is going to thereby advantage the, the, 50, or 60, the 50 minute trip at the expense of the 10 minute trip. So you're therefore encouraging people to make long trips and use the system and discouraging people from making short trips on the system. And whether you want to do that, again, that's a policy question, but that implication of the metering system should be made clear. Okay. One could look at similar results in terms of speeds. Overall speeds on the, tra overall travel speeds on the combination of freeways and ramps, these are, these are, um, would be trip speeds, drop when you took metering off. Again, metering improved overall mobility. But if we were to look at the distribution of speeds, people were typically more likely to have the same speed as each other without metering than with metering. Okay. So we can see average travel speed, 
62 kilometers an hour versus 37 kilometers an hour. Um, average travel delay, 68 seconds per kilometer versus 82. And you can see the same point. In terms of accessibility, it depends very much on how you measure it. Again, this is looking at TH-169. And one can see that, well, meters increase accessibility. Depending on how you measure accessibility, basically how you weight the travel time, it improves it by a little bit or a lot on this particular facility. We've looked at some of the other facilities. And in some cases, accessibility is worsened by metering. And similarly, one can look at the total vehicle hours traveled on the system. And um, without metering, there are 2,892 more vehicle hours per peak period. Um, and one can see, similarly, productivity. Another way of measuring efficiency on 169. 85 kilometers an hour, a different way essentially of measuring speed, a different way of aggregating speed. So we can say, what are the results of metering? Well, what MnDOT was trying to do is maximize flow through bottlenecks. Metering increased flow through bottlenecks overall, it kept speed somewhat higher, but did so basically by transferring delay from some people to others. But of course, not everyone stayed on the system after the meters were taken off. Because when you took the meters off, long trips were a lot worse off. A number of them switched their routes. They may have changed their destinations. They may have rescheduled their trips to another time. They may have done other things. Um, in general, when we talk about transportation planning, we, ha we have all of these short-term and long-term responses. Now, the study was only eight weeks, so there weren't going to be too many long-term responses to the, to, to the removal of ramp meters. But there were a lot of short-term responses. OK. Switching routes is the most obvious. I'll take an arterial instead of taking a highway, because the arterial may be less congested, may have been better off before, may be better off than it had been before. If I'm making a discretionary trip, a non-work trip, something like I'm going shopping, um, I'm visiting friends, I'm going to eat out, I might decide to go to a different restaurant, a different shopping center, visit different friends, perhaps. Um, because I either want to use the freeways now that I can use them for short trips, or I don't want to use them because it was a long trip. I can reschedule my trip. I can now travel on the off-peak instead of traveling in the peak. I can now travel on the week. I might now travel on the weekends instead of traveling on the weekdays. And potentially, I might carpool or take transit or do something else, depending on the nature of the trip. A long-term response, probably we're not going to see those over the course of this particular study. So measure no total number of trips, and we measure total vehicle kilometers traveled. Unfortunately, we don't know how many people are going from a particular on-ramp to a particular off-ramp. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that would sort of give us a very nice way of measuring the demand changes. But by looking at what happens to total trips and total vehicle kilometers traveled, we can see how average trip length is changing. Okay. And what happens to total trips? Well, if we define our AM peak period as something like, um, I believe we're using 7 to 9 AM here, the total number of trips using the roadway during that time period is pretty flat. But the number of people who are using it prior to 7 in the morning, people who switch times to an earlier time period, increased markedly. A lot of time shifts. Um, more total trips that were being made during that time period. Um, look at weekday off-peak trips. Again, that increased slightly. Weekday peak trips, not just looking at the morning, but including the afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, this is vehicle kilometers traveled, not trips. Um, weekday off-peak, VKT up. Peak period vehicle kilometers traveled down. OK. So trips are, are no, probably easier to show here. What happens to average trip length? OK. 
we can estimate what we call non-work trips, or these discretionary trips, by looking at the difference between the morning and the afternoon. So if you're going southbound in the morning and northbound in the afternoon, you know, that would be maybe a typical work trip. Now, if there are more people going northbound in the afternoon than when southbound in the morning, that difference is probably explained by non-work travel. What happens to that difference? It tends to be positive. Okay. More people are using, during the ramp period, ramp metering shutoff, more people are using the freeways to make non-work trips. Now, is that a good use of the freeway system? Again, that's a policy question. Do we want to use the freeways? Originally, we decided whether we wanted to use the freeways for inner city travel or commuting trips. Now we can decide, what, do we want to use the freeways for commuting trips or for non-work trips? Traditionally, people have thought that commuting trips were more important than non-work trips. But people are beginning to think that less and less now as non-work trips may be picking up a child from daycare, which is, it more, which is more important, that you're able to pick up your child from daycare or that you get home five minutes earlier. I don't know the answer to that question. But it suggests that there are some changes in the system overall. Um, look over the whole course of the whole day, there's not much change. It's mostly in terms of t people shifting their times, in terms of total trips. And if we look in terms of trip length, it's going down. Why is length going down? Because, again, ramp meters benefited long trips at the expense of short trips. You take them off. People make a lot of short trips that they weren't used to, they didn't used to, they weren't used to be able to make. And the long trips that they used to be able to make quite easily are much more difficult now. Okay. Change in total vehicle kilometers traveled. Weekday off peaks and weekends. Some more statistics here. Okay. In general, total vehicle kilometers travel dropped while total trips increased. So we see that there's peak spreading. We see that people on freeways take more trips, but they're handling fewer vehicle kilometers. Okay. A lot more short trips, many fewer long trips. Okay. And we can see how ramp metering benefits one set of population over another. Now, overall, the total time, the total usage of the freeway didn't change a lot. The total speeds on the freeway clearly improve with metering than without. Total trip speeds, it's a much more mixed bag. One of the claims of ramp meters is that, well, yeah, maybe you're just transferring delay from one people to another, one group of people to another, but what you're doing is you're making their total travel time experience more regular, more smooth. Okay, you're eliminating travel time variation. By eliminating stop and go traffic on the freeway, people have a better sense of how long it's going to take them to go from point A to point B. The trip is more reliable. Therefore, there must be some value to that. Okay, so we can look at interday travel time variation and intraday travel time variation. Okay, compare how does the travel time change from day to day at a particular point in time. So say at, at 4 o'clock, what is the day to day travel time? Um, or we can say, how does the travel time on this freeway segment compare for at 4 o'clock versus 4.30 versus 5 o'clock and so on. And we can see the range of travel time variation. Um, we're going to use an upper bound, lower bound, and median type of graph to show this. Look at the difference between uh, metering, on, metering off minus metering on. And there's more variation without meters than with for most origin destination pairs. Um, in particular, for long, for long trips, the 77 over 80, out of 82 trips greater than three miles in length, there was more variation without meters than with. Okay. For short trips, much more mixed only true over sl for slightly half of the half of those those origin destination pairs okay so we can compare the trip distance on this axis 
versus the travel time variation. And clearly, as the trips get longer, without metering, there's much more variation. So one of the claims of metering is that it reduces variation. The evidence would seem to suggest that that's correct. So if we can value travel time variation, we may be able to measure what, are one of the, what is one of the most important benefits of metering. Okay, and we can look at a few of these graphs. Okay, same basic trends. Most, most of them are above the zero, zero line here. And we can also look at intraday, travel time variation with and without. The red line is above the blue line. Okay, again, somewhat here, not as strongly. Um, 169 northbound shows up pretty clearly. Here it's pretty small to begin with on, on Trunk Highway 62 westbound. Okay. So ramp metering does improve reliability for long trips. Travel time variation is reduced by about 1.9 minutes. Okay. Combine the long trips and the short trips, about 1.82 cents per, um, 1.82 minutes per trip. Okay. This is an, this is a, might not sound like very much, but there's studies that estimate that we can, a, we can look at the variation, the value of that travel time variation, that, tra that value of the reliability, and it suggests in terms of reliability measures alone, ramp meters in the Twin Cities save on the order of $89, $90 million a year to travelers. And you could argue about how much this is. This is based on some stated preference studies that others have done. How much would people pay to have a trip that's this much more reliable compared to how much would they pay to save a certain amount of travel time and, and, and the like. Um, but this is a positive number and it's significant. Um, and it dwarfs any of the benefits from the travel time savings alone. That is, the benefits from travel time reliability are much more significant than the benefits from saving, saving time. People are much more interested, much more interested in having, knowing how long the trip is going to be than in making sure that that trip is one minute shorter. If you can tell me with confidence that the trip is going to be 30 minutes, I'm happy. If you tell me that the trip is going to be 29 minutes with a very wide variation in how long it actually is, and sometimes it's 45 minutes and sometimes it's 15 minutes, I'm not going to be happy. So the reliability is perhaps the biggest benefit of ramp meters. And then of course the question is, well, at what level of metering do you need to guarantee that kind of reliability? And that requires further, further testing. Now, one of the things that I'm working on with the, with the data provided by the shutoff is trying to re-examine traffic flow theory. One of the difficulties in, in traffic flow theory is getting good data. The Twin Cities has very good data in that all of the freeways are instrumented, most of the instruments work, which is what, more than you can say for most metropolitan areas. So on a given day, 95 to, to 98 percent of the, in, the instruments, the detectors are working compared to, say, the Bay Area or Los Angeles, where at best you have a third to a half that are working. Now, why is that? Why do all the detectors work here and not there? Is it, it's not because the people in Minneapolis are somehow superior. Um, they may be, but, but that's not the reason. The reason is that the, the detectors are used for a control system. Okay. In the Bay Area and Los Angeles, the detectors aren't that important part of the control system. Here they are. So it's very important that the detectors be maintained properly. And so now we have working detectors throughout the system that we can use to explore traffic flow theory. Okay. We can look at the question of traffic equilibration. One of the premises in, in, in transportation engineering is that traffic is operating more or less at an equilibrium. That is, the day-to-day -day variation in traffic flow is relatively small and can be explained by things like weather and a few other things that you may know about, um, day of the week and the like. Um, and that there's a small variation from day to day. Now, of course, when you introduce a shock to the system, like taking the meters off, it takes a while for people to re return to a new equilibrium. The question is, how long does it take? The study was eight weeks long. The supposition is that the week-to-week -week variation in traffic during that period was relatively small. Um, 
so that we can make some conclusions by looking at a particular day or a particular set of days. Um, but the evidence is that if we look at, the, look at traffic flow at the end of the eight weeks, there's still more variation in terms of week-to-week -week flow than there was in the pre-shutdown period. And this is after controlling for, for snowfall and rain um, and seasonal effects. You know, November is going to have more variation than October because people are beginning to start to take time off for the holidays and the like. And so if we can look at the pre-shutdown weekly change, okay, for the same hour of a, of a given day, see a relatively small change in volume. If we look at the shutdown, the weekly change, well, it seems to be settling in. And if we were to follow this for, for enough weeks, it probably would. But we only had an eight-week study. Um, so this is the difference between the zeroth week and the first week. So this is essentially six, six different weeks of information. And the last week um, was truncated, so we don't have information for that particular period. So, well, if we partic any particular time here, it's only an approximation of what the final result would be. Um, now, on the other hand, maybe this range is acceptable to work with, but it's important to note that this range is larger than this range. Okay. When we consider the, the question of equity, we said that short trips are benefited, are benefited without meters, um, long trips are benefited with meters. But something else we may want to think about is that people who are waiting at ramps may have a different value of time than people who are sitting on a freeway. And if that's the case, then where we control the system may be very different. So one of the things that we're, we're looking at is developing a new ramp metering algorithm based on travel time, and in particular, weighting the travel times differently based on where you're, you are on the system. Okay. So instead of trying to maximize bottleneck flow rates, we're trying to do something, maximize freeway system utility, okay, by weighting travel times at the ramps plus travel times at the freeways and trying to minimize the total weighted time. That, of course, requires knowing what those weights are. So I have a study with uh, folks in the Human First Laboratory, Kathleen Harder and John Bloomfield, um, trying to look at does the perception of and valuation of time vary with traffic levels? Do people value time differently whether they're sitting in free flow conditions versus they're in stop and go conditions versus they're waiting at a, at a ramp meter and perhaps they're waiting at a ramp meter and see congestion versus waiting at a ramp meter and don't see any congestion, so are very puzzled as to why they're waiting. And one of the things that we hope to find out is there are threshold ramp meter weights. So there's some trade-off. Maybe people are okay for the first four minutes, and the fifth minute they get really annoyed. And six minutes they get really annoyed. Um, or is it something that's much more continuous? And if we can get an answer to this, we can try new ramp, ramp control strategies. This experiment is being done with a driving simulator, which you may have seen on the third floor of Mechanical. People are going to be put in this driver's seat. They're going to see traffic ahead. It looks much better if you're actually there. Um, the lights were on so the picture could be taken. And they're going, to, they're going to be driving along the roadway, seeing traffic in different traffic conditions, being subjected to different traffic conditions. And will be asked to subject, subject, subjectively rate their experience. And um, we will, based on individuals' demographics, their real travel behaviors um, and their choices and comparisons of different scenarios estimate their value of time under different conditions. So to summarize, NDOT was trying to improve freeway speeds and flows. They succeeded at doing that. However, if you look at other objectives, things that they weren't trying to do, and think that those may have been things they should consider, we can ask the questions whether we should reserve the freeways for long trips through metering, okay. whether there should be some sort of limit on delay at the ramps, how do people value time under different traffic conditions is very important here because once you're considering delay at the ramps, you then have to decide is all time equal. Um, and it might be convenient if it were. Um, but the evidence suggests that it probably isn't. MnDOT should be collecting more data. 
and that ramp meter is only part of the solution, not the whole thing. So um, with that, I guess I'll take questions. Um, We have uh, time for a few questions. I don't uh, envy Dr. Levinson in his uh, choice of a uh, research problem uh, to work on, but it seems to me that to a very large extent the study has been uh, one which uh, seeks uh, a bunch of uh, answers to questions which really don't need asking very much. I think looking, uh, uh, looking at the study, it seems to me that one ought to find a measure or measures of what is uh, really most important and nowhere in this study do I see anything that measures uh, customer satisfaction with the system. It seems to me that ought to be the uh, most important consideration. And so uh, rather than look for experiments that can be done with the instrumentation that we have available or that can become available to us, we ought to be seeking uh, measurements and instrumentation, if you will, that uh, uh, measures something that we really want to know the answer to. And uh, it, it, it just occurred to me while I was listening to the talk that uh, one such uh, measurement might be something that measures customer satisfaction with the trip he has just taken at the exit ramp where he's getting off of the freeway or after he's gotten off of the exit ramp. And I think that's a very uh, important uh, thing to know before you know what you're going to do about designing a, uh, a freeway system, or, uh, or, or I should say, controlling a freeway system. Uh, uh, how do you do that? Well, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe just uh, asking customers to honk their horn three times if they're uh, real happy, and uh, once if they're uh, not so happy. I, I can imagine the response of the people who live next to off uh, Yeah, no, 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 no. but I, what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, I, I realize I wouldn't want to be living in the house on that corner. Uh, but there are other things that, that, that uh, someone well, who's interested in doing the study might uh, address himself to in order to uh, answer the question that uh, really deserves being asked. Well, as as part as part of this as part of the ramp metering study that MinDOT performed, they engaged a consultant wh who did telephone surveys and asked people various opinions, and they did some focus groups as well. Um, and that's all nice. And MinDOT made some decisions based on that, um, in terms of how they were going to set up the subsequent ramp metering system, the one that happened after December 2001, that we have through this week. Um, and next week they're going to be starting to, to test some alternatives as well. And asking people what they think is certainly an important way of trying to assess what they think. Um, but the problem is, one, how do you formulate the question? Two, people are going to, you know, the problem with opinion polls in general is do opinion polls truly rep represent what people believe? Now, if we can go and put people in, I mean, the, the study that I'm, I'm really eager about is, putting people through the driving simulator and asking them to rate the experience under different conditions where we can get specific comparisons of specific alternatives. The problem with opinion polls is you're getting people to have one, one experience and you're asking them about hypothetical other experiences. At best, you've got two experiences which happened at times very different from each other. Try to remember back what happened two months ago and compare it to what you experienced yesterday and compare those 
and maybe people, will ha maybe people will be able to give you a good answer. But it's not a very controlled experiment when you do it. Now, having people, you know, surveying people on the highway creates a whole different set of issues. Um, you know, stopping them would obviously create one set of problems, which would be far worse than the rant meters, rant meters would be. Um, having them honk their horns would create a different set of solutions. Sure, if we could instrument every vehicle and ask people to subjectively rate this particular trip on a scale from 1 to 10, and if we knew what their trip was, we would have to know their origin and destination, and we had all of those in-vehicle instruments, that would be great information. But in terms of the constraints that we're dealing with and, and how we can actually control the system, I don't know how you would control it in response to public, anticipated public opinion based on what you did. I, I don't think uh, it, it's uh, the, the uh, some of the parameters that you measured are are, are really uh, terribly important. Uh, for example, I don't see how long the trip is uh, is a question that needs answering or data that needs uh, being put into the system. Uh, I think the most important, the, the, the question you want to frame or ask is, how happy were you with that trip you just took on the freeway? And what's our objective? To maximize people's and, happiness? And maximize, with maximize the customer satisfaction with the system. Okay, who's paying to maximize the customer satisfaction? I'm sorry? Where's the budget? There's a budget constraint. Okay, we can maximize customer satisfaction with roadways by making roads uncongested, by making them much wider than they are today. Obviously, we don't do that because there's a budget constraint, because that would imply different things about land use. There are a lot of ways we have to have constraints about how we deal with it. Now, I can maximize your satisfaction by giving you a green light at your on-ramp, the price of that is I might be giving a red light to somebody else for an extended period well, of time. Well, yeah, but that's going to, that's going to so show up So now we have to in, trade in, off in, these two in people. In the compilation now, the of all the data. Is, well, the question is, how do, you, how do you assign weights to these two people? How do you decide that you're going to benefit person A versus person B? You can either decide to do that explicitly, or you can decide to do that implicitly, but you are deciding to why, do that with why whatever control strategy you use. Why is it necessary to assign weights to these uh, two people? You've got uh, people, citizens, who are using the freeway. If you're making uh, one deliriously happy and another t uh, uh, terribly unhappy, uh, they should have equal votes in... Uh, in uh, telling you well, uh, that's, uh, that's about this. customer satisfaction. Well, I mean, if, if, you've, solved the, if you've solved the problem of, of making democracy work in an optimal way, I mean, you deserve, deserve a Nobel Prize. Um, the, the problem, of course, that, is, the, the problem is that you... you that suggests that it should be a very important objective for the road engineer. Well, the road engineer has to, has to make decisions and make trade-offs and should take public input. But you're basically saying that this should be a political decision about who we benefit and who, and who loses. And that's okay if you want it to be a, a policy decision, and we can let the legislature decide what the ramp metering rates are. And the, ramp, and the legislature has basically delegated that authority to public officials um, in the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And Minnesota Department of Transportation decided on objective to move, to move the maximum amount of traffic through a bottleneck. And that became unpopular, so that they have, they're now looking at alternative objectives. That's what they're doing. They are, responding to, they are responding to political forces by considering alternatives. One of the alternatives that they should consider is, by the strategy that they chose, they were helping some people at the expense of others. They were transferring delay on the system compared to what it would be otherwise. They were help, making some people happier and making some people unhappier. There's always that trade-off. Okay, whatever you do in, in transportation or probably anything else, you're making a trade-off that's going to help some people at the expense of others because there's a finite amount of, of capacity on the roadways. Now, I can ask which makes, what will make you happier, and I would imagine the answer is probably driving at 75 miles an hour down the freeway unimpeded. But if I'm doing that at the expense of making somebody else wait 20 minutes, that's a problem. Now the question is, do I make them wait 10 minutes so you can drive at 65 miles an hour? Do I make them wait 5 minutes so you can drive at 55 miles an hour? Do I wait, make them wait 2 minutes so you can drive at 45 miles an hour? Do I make them wait 0 minutes so you can drive at 35 miles an hour? What's the answer? If you know the answer, you know, write your congressman or become a congressman and then, you know, you can, you can start to influence the, influence the outcome. But if, if it turns out that, that we can help inform that decision through analysis, that's probably a good thing.
Well, are you su are you suggesting you don't know what your objectives are? I'm what, suggesting what, there's a what, lot of what, objectives. What, what, what are, yeah, yeah, but when you suggest a lot of objectives, all you all you succeed in doing is complicating the problem. Well, I, there was a single objective before, and that was unsatisfactory. There was. There was a single objective. What was the objective? The objective was. target volume was established for each zone and the objective was to meet that target volume in order to operate here. Free flow travel speeds pretty close to maximum flows. Yeah, but then that, that probably wasn't a very worthwhile objective. I, I'm it's an efficiency objective. We're engineers. We're, we come up with efficiency. I mean, we ask us, ask us to solve a problem and, and tell us what we're doing. And our objective is to, to produce a safe and efficient transportation system. That's, I mean, you open up the first page of any transportation engineering textbook, and that's going to be the objective. Well, is this efficient? Well, from a certain point of view, if you're looking at move and flow through the system, this is objective. It makes certain assumptions. It makes the assumptions that everybody's time is the same and interchangeable, and you don't really care about individual people's time as long as you're minimizing total time. Now, obviously everybody's time isn't the same, but we really, you know, otherwise we get into the situation where we're, you know, saying, well, rich people's time is worth more than poor people's time because they have a higher value of time per hour. We're going to make rich people's commutes faster than poor people's. We've decided not to do that. Um, but we get sa the same individual has a different value of time under different situations. If I'm waiting at, our st at a stoplight, I get really annoyed because I'm not moving. If I'm moving at least through traffic, maybe moving slowly, my, my value of time may be, may be different, maybe less. And so the question is, well, when we're trying to minimize weighted travel of time, are we coming up with the same objective? Not necessarily. But this was the objective of the system, a single clear objective, and it failed. There was a, uh, yeah. That wasn't part of my study. There was a separate study that was done that looked at crash rates, and the results from that study sh show that crash rates were lower with metering than without metering. Okay, that metering improved the safety of the system. Um, they weren't able to say that metering reduced fatalities, but they were able to say that metering reduced crash rates. Um, and by a, by a statistical. Hmm? And, prob and probably economic damages from crashes as well. Which would clearly be a good, a good thing to do. Yeah. I mean, that's a different objective than clearly a useful Yeah, and, and it's certainly something that should be considered in any, in any decision. I mean, one of the reasons that MnDOT kept some metering in place was because having some metering, basically the original goal of metering, which was to break up the platoons, could be accomplished without worrying about this particular objective. That is, if you just break up how quickly people are coming onto the roadway, you're not trying to send five people into a gap that only one vehicle can, can fit in. You're not forcing people, basically, to either decelerate suddenly at, at the edge of the ramp while they're trying to merge, or merge dangerously, if, as, as their alternative may be. Um, so that's, you know, much more generally agreed upon that that's a reasonable thing. Um, this second objective, the ma making the efficiency of, of the system work, something that we were doing in Minnesota much more aggressively than other, than other jurisdictions were doing. You had a question in the back. Yes, you, you indicated that there's a strategy that's in place now that'll be coming to an end, and then there's a, still another strategy which will be coming in place soon. Could you describe We've got four, right? We've had the original one, the meter's off, then the one that's ending soon, 
and yeah. then a new one. Could you just quickly describe the, the two, one that's just ending and the newest one, um, and what yeah. the primary objectives might be of these two, and how are you going to try and conclude uh, anything from these two uh, objectives? The strategy that's in place now um, was designed by um, top officials of MnDOT in association with consultants in order to satisfy public opinion, which was basically mixed about metering, had concluded that they were metering too much before, but that no metering was probably a bad idea as well. So they were doing some sort of in-between type of metering, which would result in not restricting the flow quite as much. There would still be some places that would get congested, but there would still be some metering, so it might not have gotten as congested as before. What's coming in place, um, they're rolling out over the system based on where they actually have the Q detectors at the ramps, is something that is going to basically be similar to this, except that if delay at the ramps becomes greater than four minutes, they're going to let more vehicles onto the roadway. So basically, they're capping the ramp delay. Now, they can only do that in specific places initially because, and this was the case as it was a few years ago, not, the whole system doesn't have these Q detectors. But they're putting them in place in order to try out, to test this new system. And you know where they have the Q detectors, where they're able to know what the delay is at the ramps, they're going to be putting this new system in place. And they're going to see how traffic responds to it. I'm not involved in that, in that particular study. But that's um, the basic idea of, of what's going on. And hopefully. That will increase public satisfaction because people will not be waiting 20 minutes at some ramps. That most they'll, at most, they should be waiting four minutes. Um, but you'll still get some of the effectiveness of the ramp meters as opposed to no ramp meters at all. I think okay. what you just said uh, was that, uh, that your uh, principal objective is to uh, maximize public satisfaction. I didn't say that. Was, I didn't say that was my principal objective. I said that there were people in Min, there were people in MnDOT who wanted to basically um, get the opinion polls to the point that would be, um, you know, that would be the, basically the most favor the most favorable opinion that people would be expressing when could, they called could, them up on the telephone. Could you write down a list of say three objectives that you believe to be the most important objectives? Three or four, not a million. Um, we are actually um, beyond time here, and um, I'd like to invite all of you to come to room 125 if you have uh, more questions for Professor Levinson. We have coffee and cookies in uh, room 125.